All right, so for today's site visit, I'm actually gonna do something I didn't want to do, but it will make sense, so hear me out. Now with these site visits, my intention is to show you a diversity of places all around the world. And I can do that because I've, I've been to quite a few places. But today, we're actually gonna stay in Greece just like last episode. So why are we doing that? Well, with the last episode, the site visit and the archeology span porn, you know, I think we're really in the headspace now. We talked all about the Bronze Age, Homer and the Iliad, and the archaeologists that literally uncovered this, this time in history, like Heinrich Schliemann, who we'll talk about more today, Arthur Evans, Carl Blegen. So rather than like going back later to Greece and then having to do a whole history refresher again, I'm going to do it now while we're all kind of still there. Um, so sorry for the monotony, but I promise you it will be worth it. So today we are going to the archaeological site of ancient Mycenae. Now, just to quickly refresh your memory, Homer does uh, talk about ancient Mycenae. Um, this is the seat of the villainous king Agamemnon, as described by the Iliad's version of the Trojan War. I'll carve Agamemnon in the stone. My name will last through the ages. And recall that in the period just prior to the Mycenaean period, uh, Minoan civilization on Crete had been the center of gravity in the Aegean. After that, the sort of power shifted over to the Mycenaean world, which was based in the southwestern part of mainland Greece in the Peloponnesian Peninsula. And it was a loosely structured society uh, based on uh, city-states and palaces, like, for example, Pylos, that's all the way in the southwestern corner of the Peloponnesian. And it was really during this period, about 1400 to 1200 BC, that what's known as the Greek world came together. You had the advent of Greek language and a more cohesive society on the mainland. Now, Mycenae seems to be at the pinnacle of the power structure there, which is why this was called the Mycenaean period. Uh, and it's in the northeastern part of the Peloponnesian Peninsula uh, in an area called the Argolid. Now, the Argolid is essentially a archaeological theme park full of the greatest hits of both the Bronze Age and then the later Classical Age. You've got the site of ancient Olympia, where the Olympic Games came from. You've got Mistress, uh, an amazing Byzantine site. Monemvasia, another amazing Byzantine site. Of course, Pylos, the other amazing Bronze Age palace. So that's in the Peloponnesian. But just in the Argolid, you have so many other sites too. You have Epidavros, the huge Roman era theater and sort of rehab center. You've got Argos, uh, a classical fortress. You have Tiryns, which is another Mycenaean, Mycenaean era palace. So there's quite a lot to see. But today we're going to focus on ancient Mycenae itself, which is really where the action was in that era. Just a 90-minute drive from Athens, it's not very difficult to get to ancient Mycenae, but you will need to rent a car or go on a coach tour from Athens because public transport is just not going to cut it. And as the site is on a hill, like most fortresses are, you're going to have to climb up. And I would also recommend, as a travel hack, if you're going to do archaeology in Greece, not go island hopping, go in the winter. It's going to be perfect outdoor weather for exercising, especially compared to more northern climes. And yeah, you're not going to go to the beach, but you're going to, you won't regret it. The weather will be beautiful and you're going to beat the crowds. Uh, that said, uh, I went in the morning, which again is another sort of hack of mine. But by the time we did leave, we did start seeing some crowds arrive. So I'd hate to see what it looks like during the summer. But in any event, um, this site does just get a fraction of the foot traffic that the Parthenon gets. So overall, it should be a bit of a more manageable visit compared to Athens, no matter when you go. So let's get to the modern history of the site, basically the excavations. Now, an important di difference between Mycenae and the other sites we've talked about, like Knossos, is the site of Mycenae was already well known. Um, most of the major features, like, for example, the treasury of Atreus, which is actually just a, a giant tomb, the largest tholos or beehive tomb in the Greek world, well, they were already above ground and visible. 
So that means for a long time, people knew where they were. And yeah, that means they were already well looted uh, by the time anyone was doing some real excavations there. Now in the 17th century, the Venetians, as in Venice, and at that point it was still an independent republic, was really in a hot contest with the Ottoman Empire for dominance in the Eastern Mediterranean. They were both naval powers. And at this time, the Argolid, where ancient Mycenae is, was under the control of the Venetians. So in 1700, the local Venetian governor had some debris cleared away from the site to make it more visitable. And it was those Venetians who first hypothesized that that Tholos tomb, not the treasury, was, you know, the, the tomb of a Mycenaean king. I mean, why not? It was huge. So pretty good guess. It soon became even more of a tourist attraction in 1796 when Napoleon invaded and conquered a lot of Italy. And the reason for this was this part of Greece and ancient Mycenae had been a stop on the Grand Tour. Now, the Grand Tour was when young gentlemen in Europe, upper class, mostly British it's associated with, uh, to get cultured, would tool around the Eastern Mediterranean. And they would do this to discover, you know, ancient Rome, ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, which were considered the pinnacles of ancient civilization uh, in that era. And along the way, they also collected or stole a bunch of stuff too. It's these young dandies who carved their names and a lot of other graffiti into ancient monuments all over the Mediterranean. In fact, at a place called the Temple of Poseidon, not far from Athens, you can find the carved signature of Lord Byron, the famous early 19th century British romantic poet. So he left his mark behind too. And anyway, back to our story. So yeah, Napoleon, the French, and the Brits not cool with each other. So a lot of the Brits, rather than going on their grand tour to Italy, which was of course easier to get to from Britain than Greece was, they diverted away to avoid the French and started going more to Greece. And hence the site of ancient Mycenae started seeing more and more traffic. In the early 1800s, Lord Elgin, around the same time he was taking stuff at the Parthenon, dropped by ancient Mycenae. He did some investigations in the Tolos tomb and he took away some pottery and stonework, which I presume is still somewhere in the British Museum. Now, at the same time, he tried to dislodge those carvings from the famous Lion's Gate, and yeah, couldn't get them off. I swear, these bags would steal anything that was not nailed down. And shortly after that, the local Ottoman governor, because remember, the Venetians and Ottomans were always fighting. Well, the Ottomans took this area and Athens from the Venetians, and they were in charge now. Well, the local Ottoman governor ordered some excavations in the Tholos tomb and supposedly found bones along with a bunch of gold, silver, and gems. And I don't even think we know what happened to that. But unfortunately, at this time, people wanted that treasure. They did not care about the bones, which I'm sure were summarily tossed away as they always were at this time. And along with those bones went all of the information that we could have gotten from the site. And obviously this uh, Ottoman governor didn't care much for stonework either because he had um, some stone pillars that were flanking the entrance to the Tholos tomb right outside of here, uh, dislodged and he sent them to a British noble as a gift. And those I know for sure are still in the British Museum where you can see them today. Now, there wasn't much going on at the site in the decades after that. I think some French archaeologists did a survey. There was a little bit of maybe investigation and some cleanup work by Greek archaeologists. But again, mostly quiet until 1876 when enter Heinrich Schliemann. He had been a young dandy from Germany who had made a ton of money enough to retire by the time he was a pretty young man. So with nothing better to do, he became an adventurer and an amateur archaeologist and became totally obsessed by the ancient Greek world. Schliemann at this point was perhaps one of the most famous men in the world, having just discovered ancient Troy a couple years earlier. 
And there, of course, he found tons of gold from what he called Priam's treasure that probably had nothing to do with Priam. And he smuggled it out of the country back to Germany. And that there in the photo is his wife sampling some of the jewels. Now, the Ottomans literally sued him for this, but I don't think they got much out of him, certainly not any of the treasure. And he was now in uh, Greece, which at this point was an independent country, so he was safe. And in his day, uh, even um, more so now, Schliemann it was a controversial figure. He was quite a fabulist. Oh, a bullshit artist. Mm. Yeah, that too. So he became known for self-glorifying portrayals of his work, making up fibs here and there, and perhaps even planting artifacts in his digs to garner more press attention. Though I do think history has largely exonerated him of this latter claim. However, he was known for his destructive archeological tactics, which is even more important for us. He did real damage uh, at the sites he investigated, especially ancient Troy, where ironically, he actually supposedly destroyed the layer of archeology, span which corresponded with the time of the Iliad and the Trojan War. So obviously the record keeping and our knowledge of what he did at Mycenae is less than ideal, but he did have a successful dig. He found that famous circle of shaft graves, which were obviously overflowing with gold. So this one was a big hit too. The most stunning find was what Schliemann dubbed Agamemnon's mask, thinking that this solid gold mask could only be fit for a king. Another amazing find was uh, one of those gold signet rings. And this one had a combat scene on it that would turn out to be nearly identical to the one found in 2015 in the tomb of the Griffin warrior. Now we've already talked about this, but one of the amazing finds from that dig 150 years after this one was the combat agate. So Schliemann found a gold signet ring, who's, uh, with the scene of which nearly matched the, that on the combat agate. So pretty amazing. Uh, now, Schliemann figured all of this belonged to Agamemnon because it was really fancy, but subsequent studies and investigations and excavations at the site have suggested that this layer of stratigraphy and this material was far earlier than Agamemnon would have been. And if you ask me if he was such a great king, this Agamemnon, why not assign the Tholos tomb to him as opposed to just a shaft grave? But as all of the useful dating information was tossed away and of course since then lost or destroyed, we'll probably never know. The team also found what would later become known as the Silver Siege Riton, and a Riton is sort of a kind of a drinking vessel. Now this uh, piece had an elaborate scene of an armed attack on a coastal settlement. Beyond its aesthetic quality, it really showed scholars kind of what warfare looked like back then, uh, how the soldiers were dressed or not dressed. <laughs> and though I think the dig here at Mycenae went a little better than the one at Troy in terms of not destroying quite as much, um, and it was rather thorough for an amateur in Schliemann's time, it was unimaginably destructive by today's standards. In fact, of the Troy uh, excavation, uh, American archaeologist and professor at Tulane University, Kenneth Harrell, quipped that Schliemann did what the ancient Greeks couldn't accomplish in their own time, which was to level the entire city walls of Troy down to the ground. Well, whatever you think of Schliemann, we can say at least one thing for him. He was prompt in publishing his uh, results. Uh, which he did in 1878, just two years after the dig began. And that's a lot more than I can say for a lot of archaeologists today. I'm just saying. Okay, so let's talk about your visit. Just down the road a little ways from the modern parking lot, you'll find the treasury of Atreus. Now, remember, that's really just the largest Tholos tomb in all of the Greek world. But the name treasury, I guess, just stuck. Well, I wouldn't recommend going there first. I'd recommend seeing the site first and the museum and then coming back there. And it is cool to see because of the scale of it and the, the workmanship. However, there's not much inside. 
And that is something that's kind of a shame about the site. I mean, it's good that the gold actually did stay in Greek hands as opposed to the stuff from Troy, which remember was sent to Berlin and then stolen by the Soviets. But to see the riches from ancient Mycenae, you do need to go to the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. It's not on site. So you really need to proceed your visit to ancient Mycenae with a stop at that museum in Athens first, because that's really where the most impressive artifacts are kept. Now, I know why they might have done that. First of all, Athens is much more visited than here, so more people would see them in that sense. Secondly, with all of the museum heists going on in Europe, especially in Germany, I would imagine that those artifacts are safer in that big museum in Athens than they would be on this small on-site museum in the countryside. However, stripped away from their context from the site, those objects lose some of their power their narrative quality and their historic context. They're just kind of bling. And the site of ancient Mycenae itself loses some of its narrative power. Without the riches and all that wealth concentrated there for you to see, you kind of lose how important a center this was once, uh, once upon a time, and therefore how important of a site it is. And it's also a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you remove the most bling artifacts to Athens, less people are going to visit the site and they're going to continue to visit the archaeological museum in Athens, not here. So as you walk through the main entrance to the site, head directly to the left to the small on-site museum. Now the museum uh, does explain briefly some of like how it was excavated, um, where Mycenae sort of sits in history in relation to other periods of Greece. But to be honest, and this is coming from a real museum nerd, it's not a great museum. Uh, they do have some interesting panels, like one on trade, which explains thematically some of um, how Mycenae was important and what life there was like. But most of it, to be honest, was just pretty random. They had a panel about women, one about children, one about a blacksmith, uh, focuses, focusing in on different parts of the site, but there really wasn't a cohesive story told. There was no multimedia or the little bit there was wasn't working. Um, there was nothing interactive. So it just wasn't that exciting and it sort of gave you a very disjointed views into the site. No overarching view and story told. And that's a shame because like many marquee archaeological sites, Ancient Mycenae is very complex. It, it really just is a big old palimpsest. Okay, you see the definition right there. I, I know that sounds like some kind of a weird sexual activity or something, but trust me, it's a very, very common archeological term. But anyway, it's very complex. Without any kind of on-site video or multimedia display that really took you through the whole history, it just kind of gets lost. For example, when you ascend the summit of the fortress, you'll see the remains of an ancient Greek temple. And it doesn't really ever strike you that that's a thousand years after the main action at Mycenae, which was during the Bronze Age. The sign never really alludes to that. And even for me, having studied this, it wasn't quite clear. I know at the center of these Bronze Age palaces, there was a throne room. And I don't think it even says it on site, but that was largely washed away and built over, which is why you see that, that uh, temple. Now, uh, the, the on-site interpretation with the signage is really not that great. It just kind of says like, this is what you're looking at here. This is kind of what you're looking at there. There's no cohesive story. So as I always say, and broken record alert, splurge for a guide, you won't regret it. Anyway, after visiting the museum, which should take you no more than an hour, start climbing up the hill. You'll pass through the famous Lion's Gate, which is still very much intact. And as you do that, imagine yourself as a priest or a soldier or a slave. And you're looking at this for the first time and feeling that awe, knowing the palace is waiting for you at the top of the hill, which is where political, religious, whatever kind of power there was at this time resided. 
And on your way up to the top, you'll see some other ruins, some residential areas, some graves. You'll see the famous uh, circle of shaft tombs that Schliemann found. So you'll notice all of that on the way up and take some time to take it all in. When you get to the top, you'll see the most prominent feature there, which is the ruins of that classical temple that I just alluded to a couple minutes ago. You'll see immediately why they plopped a big old fortress there once you see the commanding views of the surrounding countryside. Now, you'll go behind that classical Greek temple. You'll see a cistern, which is how they stored water up there, and go around the back uh, to complete the circuit. Now, the whole thing, including a thorough walk around and look at the museum, should take you three hours tops. As I mentioned at the beginning, winter really is the best time to go in terms of the minimal crowds and the comfortable weather. On the other hand, in terms of food and accommodation, it didn't look like there was much open on site or in the nearby village. So you might have to pack a lunch or stop along the way if you're going at this time of year. However, given the number of sites in just the Argolid alone, I recommend actually not making this a day trip, but if you can swing it, spend a night or two in the region. There's, there's plenty to see. But one site that you might miss if you're just kind of looking at a map is the nearby Arcadico Bridge. Now, this is a Mycenaean era bridge that can still bear the weight of a car. It's the oldest bridge in Europe at 3,200 to 3,300 years old. Take that tower bridge. And in my mind, you know, with all the other things to see, like Epidavros, the theater, and Argos, why schlep back all the way to Athens? I'd really recommend basing yourself for a night or two at Naphtleon. This is known to be Greece's most romantic city. And having seen a lot of cities in Greece, at least from my standpoint, that was true. It has a beautiful coastal walk and an amazing Venetian era fort that you can climb up to. It's got great restaurants, uh, nice boutique shopping, and some small but interesting museums of its own. Now, in all of Greece, my favorite store that I visited was called Agnithis. I probably butchered that pronunciation. But anyway, a mother-daughter team there weaves silk creations out of a traditional loom. Very nice stuff. They deliver. I definitely recommend a visit there. So, while I would certainly urge you to visit the Argolid and the Peloponnesian Peninsula, as a standalone, the archaeological site of ancient Mycenae is a three and a half out of five stars in my book. It's incredibly historically important. It's nearby but far away from the jostling crowds at the Parthenon, and it's very easily accessible to a slew of other sites. So if you're actively tracing this period in Greek history and you're doing a tour of the Peloponnesian, the site is not to be missed. But if you're kind of doing a quick hits of the most Instagrammable sites in Greece, definitely not the way I roll, but to each his or her own, I'd actually give it a skip. Hey, if you like what you heard, give me that thumbs up below, hit that bell to subscribe, or if you want to support more independent archaeology content, consider contributing to my Patreon, where you can enjoy some exclusive members-only benefits and other goodies. Until the next dig.